is very difficult. Uh, I would like to know who was here this morning. Can you raise your hands? Oh, that's so fantastic. So, it's not necessary to start all over. Good. Um, I'm, I love being induced by Marcus Lutyens. It's one of the reasons this whole thing happened was because Marcus is in California and I'm in Rome, and after Documenta, it's, it's a desperate situation. He once tried to create a, a, an, 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 an induction and sent it as a file, an audio file. And it was really terrible to be with his computer and listen to him and his voice telling me to relax. It was terrible. <laughs> but he sent me one which is very good for sleeping when you have insomnia. And that one I've used several times. But the real acceptation I know it should be the generosity of being here with all the students and it should be the pleasures of being with, with Fernando and with Rene and Irene and it very much is that. And the great sneaky pleasure of criticizing T.J. Demos's criticism. But one of the main reasons was that I could get hypnotized by Marcus and thank God it happened. And so, it, it, it's like you have to kind of pay a fee, so I prepared this all lecture was like work. So, that sounds very egocentric. Speaking of which, <laughs> Joseph Boyce was a bit egocentric, but I was asked by the Metropolitan Museum to give a lecture on why Andy Warhol was not the greatest artist of the 20th century about three months ago. And I said, well, why are you asking me that? I'm not an Andy Warhol expert at all. And they said, because your documenta says that. And I thought about it, and it's interesting because it does. And so the logic of saying who the greatest artist was of the 20th century seemed impossible because it implies using a certain number of protocols of hierarchies, of judgment, and even that was not exactly part of the documenta because there was Etel Adnan's paintings, because there was Gunnar Richter, who's not been considered an artist by anyone except for himself when he was at art school 40 years ago, giving talks about Breitenau being a concentration camp and a labor camp and a girls' reformatory and so on. So we did a lot of things that were not in the logic of who is the most important artist of the 20th century. But once one does enter into that logic, which is somehow the logic of what do the people around you think is the most important artist of the 20th century in terms of what stories we tell that can uh, allow agencer other stories to be told, it must be said that this particular artist of the 20th century did have a sense of the fact that you could not distinguish the notion of a social sculpture from the being in the world with all its growth and materialities and plants and trees, the so-called ecological. And this is a picture of him in his office for direct democracy at the Documenta in 72, Harald Zeman Documenta. And somehow, from the perspective of some 20th century perspectives on who is the most important artist of the 20th century within the 21st century, like time travel, ta 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 ta, it could be Boyce instead of Andy Warhol. So that's what I said at the Metropolitan, and they said, aha, uh -huh, the usual European. <laughs> so the, those were orchids, maybe, no? No, a rose, but it's not a rose. It's not a rose. But his multiple is with the rose. It's not a rose. It's a rose. It looks to me like an orchid. So this is what happens with Vincien and with Marcus. To me, it looks like an orchid. Anyway, there he is planting trees and so on and so forth and interacting with the coyote or maybe not because apparently the coyote had been fed a lot of meat so it wasn't really that dangerous in New York. But I had prepared a whole lecture and then there was this beautiful picture 
of Elio Oiticica, the Brazilian artist, and this artwork was done in the late 60s, and it's called Giving the Earth Back to the Earth. And it's very literal. You can see what he did. He put some earth back on the earth. And it's a square because it's sort of minimalist or constructivist, but it's not. Same time as boys. Then there was, I was going to tell you all about Pinone and what it is to touch. And that when you touch the tree, it grows differently in that place where the hand is on the bark. And he put his surrogate little hand there. And it's still in the Alps about um, 20 minutes from Torino. The tree has a different shape. And this is him making a sculpture with a rock and a tree. And that's also there. It's 20 minutes away, but the tree isn't there anymore, and the stone is. And, and this is an early work of his where he um, wanted to give a form, but wanted to follow the form that was already the form, and wanting to time travel. And so he basically was sculpting around the knots in a tree to arrive at the state of the tree at an earlier age of the tree basically. So it's not a representation of a tree within a log, industrial log, it's just the tree at a time before the tree was a log. And it's a little bit like the Chris Marker film. How many minutes? Oh, wow. So I just wanted to go to a particular, that's the Penone in the Documenta now with people, but you know, the people and the, I mean, the artwork is not the bronze sculpture and the stone in it or the little tree next to the bronze sculpture in the stone, the, the artwork is a little bit that uh, transitional space that it articulates. Uh, it's sort of a how you make a place. So it's very literal. And then I wanted to talk to you about this, but I'm just going to skip really fast. The, ah, voila, this one is an interesting thing. So two more things. So there's an artist, a young artist in California, and her name is Amy Balkin. And she's interested in um, the atmosphere, and she makes these public parks in, on top of certain areas that are like a place that's supposed to be not polluted. And that's a little bit metaphoric and symbolic, so we took it a little more literally in the documenta, and I spent about three years or four years sending letters to the ministers of the environment or ministers of culture or ministers of geography or ministers of mining or prime ministers or vice prime ministers or associate ministers to the ministry of ministries or presidents of republics or vice presidents of republics. I think I sent thousands of letters as a kind of hand directed by Amy Balkin because of the power that I had. Having the power of being the director of Documenta, somebody will open the envelope, not necessarily the minister. And so someone will also answer. So I wrote and wrote and wrote. It was a rather standard letter asking if they would be a country that would support the Earth's atmosphere becoming a World Heritage Site. And you need five states to make a petition to the UNESCO. And on the right, you have an example of the letters on the wall, because every documenta needs a conceptual project that looks like letters. Whether it's Hane Darboven, on Cavara with, you know, you just have to have it because document is very serious. <laughs> and therefore, we had it. And that's a very small number of the letters. And on the left are the totality of the replies, actually. And some of the, at the beginning of the process, actually. And in the middle are these cards, and the cards were, were sent to, this was one of the positive replies from Tonga. Uh, can somebody read the words? Uh, can somebody with better eyes than me read that um, out loud? Can you read it? Uh, 
receive in relation to your request the tongs Tonga Tonga takes the lead and the, and the initiating state party recommending the implementation of an extraordinary processes in the next UNFCC conference of parties COP17 or another appropriated context in tw um, 2011 in respect to inscribing the Earth atmosphere on the world heritage list. Is it heritage? No. Yes, list. Heri yeah. list. We would very much like to support this initiative, but I would like to know what the financial and resources implication are as Tonga is a small country with a small national UNESCO commission office and a still struggling economy. If we are giving some idea as to the time needed and the kinds of support we would be expected to provide we could be most grateful. Kind regards, Anna. And Anna is the Minister of Education and Women's Affairs and Culture in of the Kingdom of Tonga. So uh, that could be analyzed for the next four or five hours, um, but I find it extremely fantastic. Uh, we answered that there would be no financial uh, requirements and Tonga accepted and then it didn't work out anyway so there you go but the notion of failure in art and anyway just to go 30 seconds over it the, the project wasn't really only about getting it inscribed because it was also about the problems of risk and destruction that things undergo when they are inscribed because inscribing things on the World Heritage List whether they're material or immaterial culture, is also a very tricky and dangerous slope. And there's been analyses like by Dario Gamboni about the risks that things undergo when they are inscribed, like the Buddhas, the Bamiyan Buddhas. Because sometimes when you map, you know, like it's mapping the DNA of something or you, you, you list something, you're suddenly putting a lot of focus also on that something. So there's a bit of a um, aporia, I mean, there's a problem. <laughs> to think about and to resolve around that as well, which was part of that project. Okay, that's it. <laughs>